She's an award-winning writer, a hunting guide, archery and rifle instructor, keynote speaker, and all-around outdoors woman who encourages you to get outside, hunt, fish, shoot, and savor all that life has to offer. And now, here's your host, Mia Anstein. Hey, hi, hello, you all. I'm so happy to be visiting with you again. Welcome to the show. If you've been here before, thank you for returning. And to those of you that are new, welcome, and I hope you enjoy the show. Today, I have a special guest, a friend who is working on some great projects. I don't want to take up too much time because we did have a lengthy conversation about many things. If there's anything you are looking for, I will include it in the show notes. And if you have any questions or would like to give us a shout out, you can find us at contact at miaanstein.com or on social media under Mia Anstein. Here's the show. Hey, you all. Today, we are joined by Tom Oprey of the Shepherds of Wildlife Society. Tom is an award-winning filmmaker and wildlife steward, and Tom and I met at the Professional Outdoor Media Association where we kind of brushed elbows but never really got to know each other, and over the years, our paths have been crossing more and more, and recently, we bumped elbows at the NASC Summit and got a little briefing of one of his films, but I also wanted to talk about one that you recently released and have been sharing with legislators, which is who we were rubbing elbows with. So, Tom, I know that just like me, you wear a lot of hats. Is there anything else that you would like my listeners to know about you and your background? Yeah, well, yeah, it's, it's, I really, first of all, thanks for having me on your podcast. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you and, and all the people that listen to you and your voice. It's, it's really important that people like you continue to tell the real story of modern wildlife conservation and how important it is that we be active stewards of the land. And that includes things like hunting. So who am I? Well, uh, you know, it, it's funny. I'm a second generation outdoor communicator. Uh, I was blessed to grow up in a family where my dad wrote for Outdoor Life and Field and Stream for 30 years. Um, didn't want to have anything to do with outdoor writing or anything like that. Uh, well, I guess I sort of did when I was really young because, you know, what kid doesn't want to be like their dad, right? And of course, my dad was doing some pretty cool things and uh, hunting and fishing and camping and boating and recreating all over the world. And, uh, but, you know, I, I, I used to sneak in my dad's office and back in the late 1960s and early 70s uh, when I was really, really young. But I used to sneak in his office uh, not long after he had made a bunch of outdoor films. And uh, and this was mostly fish and stuff. I grew up in Michigan in the Great Lakes State. And, uh, you know, it was pretty cool. He had these float planes that were sweeping down over boats and uh, up in Canada. You know, guys were fishing for walleye and northern pike. And there was a little bit of hunting stuff. But I thought that was really cool. And I, for some reason, it just stuck in my head. It's like, you know what? I kind of like this outdoor stuff. But I don't like being an outdoor writer because I don't get paid anything. But I'm going to be a filmmaker. And uh, I, I'd, I'd run across, uh, talk to some somebody that said that the local you know, TV stations in Detroit outside of where I grew up were paying $30,000 for producers. And I'm like, that's what I want to do. So I ended up getting uh, a scholarship to play football in college and it paid for school and the school happened to have a, a brand new modern PBS station. And so I ended up my senior year practically working full time at the station. And from there, I, I got involved in, in the film industry and moved to Florida to kind of chase after the feature films and, and then televisions and episodic television. So kind of I worked on some big films, some of the old Iron Eagle movies, worked with Martin Sheen, Ralph Macchio, Louis Gossett wow. Jr., people like that when I was a kid. And then I started doing some business uh, in the in the commercial side of things. Well, I've got Shark Week call from Discovery Channel. I ended up doing uh, producing their premiere show when I was 24 years old. So, you know, I just was in the right place at the right time and really had nothing to do with the outdoor world other than, you know, I love being outside and love recreating out there, uh, hunting and fishing and just spending time out in God's great great you know places but you know this this thing just happened and then next thing i know this company called cd watercraft called me up and said hey we heard you know how to do a few things on the water could you help us organize all our productions and so for about the next 10 or 12 years i organized everything from 
you know, uh, lifestyle photography shoots to action shoots to million dollar TV commercials. Uh, and, and it got to the point where they were hiring me to do all this stuff. And then my first job directing their national TV commercials, I think I was 27 years old. And I hired a guy named Dan Mendel to be our director of photography. And Dan and I had worked the previous year on a million dollar production. And the client was like, well, we want to do it for a little bit cheaper this year. Could you do that for us? And of course, I'm just a kid, right? But I do have a production company. So yeah, I said, of course we can. And uh, yeah, it was a pretty substantial budget. Dan came to work for me. Dan, for any of you guys that are starting, Trek or Star Wars fans has been the director of photography in the last two J.J. Abrams Star Wars and the last two J.J. Abrams Star Trek movies. So, uh, you know, I was really, really lucky to work with some some incredible people uh, in the film business, have some great uh, opportunities to, to do some incredible work. Didn't really do much in the outdoor side of things, though. I would get a call once in a while, do a fishing commercial down in Florida. I used to work right out of college for a guy named Glenn Lau. Uh, Glenn recently passed away or passed away this past year. And, and this guy was just, a, just an incredible filmmaker. Uh, his TV commercials in the outdoor uh, field sports space, especially his fishing commercials, some of them won Golden Lion Awards at, at Con, which is a huge, huge honor for a television commercial. And especially when it's a fishing commercial, you know, <laughs> you're up there against the Mercedes Benzes of the world. And so, you know, I just, again, it's just been a lot of hard work and a lot of fun, but, you know, I, I my dad retired from full-time writing and, and, uh, but, you know, as a kid, we always came out West and, and, uh, when I was in uh, my late twenties, I kind of figured out how to get back to, to places like Montana, the Rocky mountain West, which, you know, ever since I was going to all these, uh, we used to go to these outdoor writer conventions and, and, uh, it was always seemed like we were always out West every, about every other year. And so ever since I've been knee high to somebody's britches, I always wanted to have a place out here. And so I finally made it happen. And, and I've been in Montana for 25 years now and still doing, you know, filmmaking and whatnot. And then, uh, from there, I, we did some outdoor field sports, uh, had a TV show called Eye of the Hunter on NBC sports that ran for seven years, uh, through 2015. Uh, and then in 2015, in July of that year, a lion named Cecil was shot in Zimbabwe. And our deal was through 2018 with NBC Sports, but they pulled the plug on us and said, sorry, guys, we love you, but we're not going to we're not going to air any more field sport programming. So it really made a difference on, on what we were doing and how we were doing it. We're still doing TV commercials for folks. I mean, I've done commercials for all kinds of different companies in the outdoor field space world, you know, everything from Matthews Archery to Abu Garcia and Berkeley to uh, night muzzle loaders to federal cartridge. I mean, just, just a ton of stuff over the years, you know, Aimpoint, Otis Technology. I think I've been the voice of Otis Technology and Aimpoint for decades. Yeah, it, it's just been really cool just an incredible experience and uh but the, the key thing is, is is after 2015 i realized that you know hunting and the outdoor field sports and stuff i mean it's really under attack and and what we put out there as hunters is really it, it's not very palatable to the broader public because most people don't even know where they get their food from right. and so uh, you, you have this huge disconnect when it comes to nature, you know, as sportsmen and sportswomen, you know, we're out in the field, we're watching what happens. It's not unexpected. This, you know, we, we run across a, a mountain lion kill. We know what happened. You know, it's not some horror movie. I mean, it might be like one if you're the deer or a moose, but uh, you know, we understand what happens and we know what's going on because we're a part of nature and humans always have been and always will be. So, you know, I kept thinking, well, like, I got to think of something different to do here. So we started pushing some wild life conservation projects which are online projects that would you know we'd push them out through social media on facebook and instagram and then turn around also on amazon prime because back then we could launch different projects on there and and if you weren't charging anything they'd allow anybody that has a prime membership to watch it fortunately amazon's changed that thing a couple about a year ago but we just saw a real need to start telling the real story about conservation and, and what really is conservation because there's a lot of folks that have usurped that name or that word i'm having an, an having coffee with a local uh journalist here it writes for the, our local newspaper and we just recently had a uh, federal judge stop uh, certain parts of our wolf hunt here in montana because the center for biological diversity and the humane society had filed suit uh and of course the byline was a conservation organization stopped wolf hunt and then the next first line is the center for biological diversity humane society in the united states uh you know con you know they, they call them 
conservation groups. And uh, I had to reach out via email to the uh, journalists and say, I'm sorry, you know, I have a journalism degree and, and these groups, uh, you need to do your, your history here, do a little better fact checking because you've labeled these groups as something they're 180 degrees, you know, in right. a different direction. And this is something that we recently, ranchers were taken up to the Blackfoot to tour the Blackfoot project up in Montana, these organizations that you're referring to, they are deeming themselves conservation organizations, which you and I both know they're not. They're preservation, which is actually not good for wildlife or habitat. They're calling actual conservation organizations like Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, which is right there nearby. They're calling those ungulate organizations because they don't really focus on, according to them, they're not focusing on the greater population, you know, wolves. They're only focusing on, you know, hooved animals. So that's something I think that our listeners really need to know that there is a difference. And I know you're going to get into the difference in what conservation really is. And hopefully understand that those organizations are not really speaking on a conservation subject. Mia, these groups are the antichrist. I mean, the antichrist of wildlife conservation. These groups are interested in one thing and one thing only, power and control. They are telling people that they're, you know, conservation is a word that humans understand. I mean, if you look it up in Webster's, it's very simple. It's the wise use of a natural resource. And the two antidotes that Webster's use is water conservation and wildlife conservation. You must utilize that natural resource in order to conserve right. it. I will say, you know, the real definition is, is the wise use of a natural resource, but also the wise use and good stewardship of a natural yes. resource. So to say that the Elk Foundation or the Sheep Foundation or Pheasants Forever are not conservation organizations because they have a single-minded purpose in so much as that they're putting money on the ground to make sure there's more sheep on the mountain or there's more winter range for elk or so forth. But you have to understand, as, as sportsmen, when you, the reason why we have deer and turkeys and, and rabbits in people's backyards, the reason why there's birds in your bird feeds, the reason why we have national forests is because of hunters going hunting. And that is the track record of what our country here in the United States has done since, you know, our, you know we have a, a terrible track record as human beings taking care of wildlife resources. And I mean, look at our country in the 16, 17, 1800s. I mean, I can trace my lineage back to New England in the 1620s. We destroyed our wildlife resources and the habitat that that in, in the name of progress, because we didn't know any better. But guys like George Bird Grinnell, uh, President Roosevelt, Theodore Roosevelt, and others like them at the turn of the century in the late 1800s figured out, hey, these are important things. If we're going to have them, we need to take care of them. And this whole modern conservation ethos was spawned then. And over the yeah. last 120 years, 130 years, 140 years, we have done incredible work. I say we, you know, hunters and the money that's spent on hunting and shooters, you know, the money that's created for that from excise taxes and license fees has propagated some of them, you know, incredible populations of wildlife. It's not all wonderful, but it's all pretty dang good compared to where it is across most of the rest of the world. Matter of fact, if you are to look up and talk to the folks from the IUCN, which is kind of this quasi government organizations that oversees the world's wildlife populations and reports on their status with their red list, the only two places in the world where wildlife populations are stable or expanding is North America because of that modern conservation, conservation ethos, our, our modern conservation management plan, and Southern Africa where they have ranching for wildlife where they've decided, right. hey, you know, people at landowners there have figured out, hey, wait a minute, you know, the land doesn't do very well with these domestic animals on it, but these wild animals, hell, they, they've evolved here. They do very well here, and we can actually utilize them as, as great meat. And so uh, there's a market for it. Not only will people pay to go hunt them, but the, you know, the meat that's left over can be taken from the markets, and, and they can utilize that to feed the people. So right, and that really leads me people. to why I wanted you on the show and that's because of your film as a filmmaker. I used to watch Eye of the Hunter and I didn't know that you were the producer of it until I met you at Poma. And I was like, oh, wow, I didn't, you know, that was a great thing that was there. But now you had released Killing the Shepherd. In that documentary, you just encapsulated both sides of everything that is going on, or I guess there's even more than two sides down there, but the whole culture of the area 
and primarily how they are saving wildlife and habitat in Africa. So can you tell us a little about the movie, how it was inspired and um, what your goal is with it? Yeah, you know, and that kind of lends itself back to the first question, you know, who am I and what am I doing? And so in 2016, uh, there was a a conservation and say all these conservation groups. So this is the the hunting groups, (laughs) the professional outfitters and guides, the the, the wildlife centric NGOs, non-government organizations, so that's your sheep and elk and all those folks. They all got together in Atlanta at a hotel and did this crucial conservation seminar. And, And I gave a presentation about you know, what is that? What are the perceptions by uh, the broader society uh, about hunting and hunters? And it's not pretty. I mean, you know, I, I you, you, hunters post like to post, you know, what they've done and you know, look at this big buck, this booner I have. And, and uh, you know, there's just a lot of stuff that when you have this huge disconnect, um, you know, we're talking that, you know, obviously you know, we've got 200 and, and uh, or 330 million people living in the United States, depending on who you talk to. Well, only about four or five percent of the U.S. population buys a hunting license, and that's based on U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service data on any given year. So we're a very small minority, and then that means the rest of these people, you know, some people understand what hunting is and conservation, but a lot of people don't. And so when when what I did in the seminar was really delve into, you know, what people see and what it looks like. And as I said, it's not a pretty picture because, you know, I, you know, if a guy goes out and shoots a, a, a lion or goes and shoots a, a big bull elk or something like that, and uh, that animal's got some blood on it, whatever, and the guy's holding the rack or holding the head. And I, I understand, you know, what that hunter's gone through. I mean, I've been a sports my whole life. I mean, I don't think I bought a piece of beef until I was in my early to mid twenties uh, working in the film business. Cause you know, that's how we, my dad fed our family was eating venison and um and fish and turkeys and anything else we could get our hands on but uh you know it it, people when they see that picture on social media a lot of them connotated to being no different than the than the terrorists the isis terrorists in syria that would cut off the heads of human beings during the craziness that went on there and post that stuff on youtube today you can still watch it on youtube and so it's really easy because there's this disconnect. They don't understand how modern conservation works. You know, I mean, we're talking about wildlife. We're talking about renewable species of animals. They have babies in 90, 90% of the cases, except for elephants and a few other species. They have new young every year, uh, multiple new young in many cases. Uh, and so you, you have to have, you know, environments that can sustain these animals and so as good stewards of the land and based on our modern conservation ethos we've always taken care of those things and you know we need to do a better job in certain things you know maybe there's some places there's too many deer so you've got car deer collisions or there's crop predation things like that they're dealing but these are issues because we've done a good job of making sure we have these wildlife resources they've been able to to come back and rebound from from the lows they were from our ancestors but the reality is is people don't get it they don't understand where their food comes from they don't understand why you hunt and hunters are not very good about telling people about why we hunt i mean if you if you were to go and and just do a google search of of uh you know i looked at i guess it was there's about 280 some tv shows when i did this presentation that are hunting centric shows on just three cable channels which would be the outdoor channel sports channel pursuit channel it doesn't account you know the, you know all these online and youtube channels and everything else and then you go and you watch some of this stuff. And I mean, being a filmmaker, being done television, episodic television, and you know, the real stuff, Hollywood stuff. I, and I watch this stuff. And I, and I honestly, I, I have to grimace a little bit. I mean, I appreciate the effort people want to do because they're passionate about it. But 99% of outdoor television shouldn't be on television because it does not represent hunting in a way that is, is acceptable to the broader public. And, and I think so, people forget about the broader public quite a bit. I've, I've had friends on social media that I've had debates with because I come from a hunting family, but I have, you know, aunts that they don't want to see the picture of the dead animal. They don't mind that I hunt, but they don't want to see that picture. And so I don't know that everybody understands that not everybody thinks that's pretty and at least clean it up, be respectful. Um, I do like that there are some people in the outdoor industry that have made it their mission to make sure the messaging is out there, that we're showing respect and that we're doing good things and they're sharing a different story rather than just the dead animal. And I think sharing that story is impactful on a lot more people. 
And when you shared the story about killing the shepherd, it definitely, even to me who I already hunt, it was very impactful. And I think I could relate it, even though it's in Africa, I could relate it right back to home. Yeah, so. 100%. Yeah, it, the parallels are there across the board. I mean, that's just face it, Mia. Most people in modern Western civilization have, have outsourced their killing. I mean, I like to ask people when I'm at a presentation, you know, we'll, we'll screen this film and we'll get into more details about the film and answer that question. But when we do screenings at film festivals, so the film came out in 2021, we ended up putting it uh, up for a bunch of you know different film festivals. You have to actually submit to them. Uh, I didn't think we were going to get much traction. We ended up getting uh, 41 different film festivals around the world, picked up the film. We won 21 major awards, you know, best documentary, best cinematography, you know, kind of the normal filmmaking type stuff. But we won a handful of awards for social justice, indigenous and human rights. And to me, that was really important because, you know, the fact that we've outsourced our killing, we have this disconnect with society. I mean, and I sit there in these screenings and people are like, well, do we really need to kill any animals? And it's like, well, wait a minute here. How many people in the room have bought a McDonald's Happy Meal? You know, and everybody, you know, you got to get the gift for the kid, you know, the prize, all that stuff. And I'm like, okay, well, let me clue you into something here. There's nothing happy about a Happy Meal. Do you understand? There's nothing happy about a happy meal it doesn't matter if you got the cheeseburger or the chicken nuggets you paid someone to raise and slaughter an animal to feed your kid and without the death of 60 billion land-based animals and 1.4 trillion this is un data 1.4 trillion water-based animals humanity ceases to exist we have to eat you have to explain to people, you get this connection now that's like, okay, I get it. And so what happened for me is while I finished up doing this presentation, I had this gentleman come from Zambia, this big, big tall white guy came over and started talking to me. He started telling me this story about this crazy story about this woman chief that came and knocked on his door. He had an import export business that dealt with the mining industry, which the copper mining industry is a, is a big economic driver in Zambia and has been for a long time. And so he said, yeah, this gal came and knocked on my door. And, and at the time, this guy is uh, he also affiliated with the professional hunting industry, had been the chairman of their professional hunting and scouting uh, organization in Zambia. He's like, yeah, this gal wanted some help. She wanted me to come to this area that the government had named as a game depleted hunting concession, which means there is no hunting quota available. So she's asking a guy who's kind of on the, you know, who's in the hunting industry, doesn't have his own operation, but is just, he's also a licensed professional hunter, but she'd heard this guy was honest and she needs some help. She's like, my people are dying. You know, we don't have any resources. And so this guy had actually, this guy's named Roland Norton and Roland had been out into this area back in the late eighties. Yeah, and it, it, back then it was in its Valhalla. I mean, this place had the big five of Africa. So your lion or your elephant, rhino, Cape Buffalo, you know, leopard, all that stuff. You know, it's just, a, just a beautiful place, big valley, about two and a half million acres. So you're saying, you know, something that's, you know, twice the size of the state of Delaware or, or the Grand Canyon National Park. He went out and took a look at it. His son, Alistair, was, a, was in his early to mid-30s and was a professional hunter, a full-time professional hunter and hunting in a different area. And they went out and looked at it and said, wow, this is cool. And, and Roland had, had this dream that he always wanted to have his own uh, hunting operation and not be working for somebody else. Yeah, but this is an area that didn't even have any hunting quota, nor, you know, was there any guarantee that they would ever have any hunting quota. And he's like, you know what, I can see there's a solution to the problem here, we've got to figure out a way to uplift the community. And the first thing, you know, they went around and, and, and then and this country is, it, this is not the Serengeti, it, it's, it's a rugged valley with a river running down through the middle of it, full of crocs. There's not too many crocs, that, you know, the crocs aren't targeted by the poachers. But what had happened is in 2001 and 2002, because of some issues of corruption within the government, the entire country shut down safari hunting. So there was bans on safari hunting for two years. And that kind of ushered in this whole effort by criminal gangs, a very, very, uh, I would say, organized, almost militaristic gangs, bushmeat 
which is a, a $2 billion black market industry in Africa. Uh, you know, bushmeat, I mean, it's people considered a right to eat. And of course, in the cities where most people live, there's a real market for it. So what happens is, is bushmeat poachers will go into these areas. They'll set up camp smack dab in the middle of wherever there's animals. And when you have a ban on hunting, the hunting operators are no longer in the field. So there's nobody there to keep an eye on things. And the government doesn't have the resources, doesn't have the, the game scouts and all that stuff. They're just trying to keep people out, you know, keep people from poaching out all of the national parks. And they can't do a good job of that because they just don't have the resources. So, so there's a real problem there. And then when you don't have the operators, the safari operators working in the game concession areas, then there's nobody there. So it's, it's a free for all. And that's what happened uh, 20, you know, 20, 20, 22, 23 years ago and the wildlife was decimated um you know people moved in poachers moved in they built little villages that were nothing but poaching villages and this particular area it's only about a four or five hour drive from the capital of lusaka in zambia and so they were able to i mean literally i mean certain species went locally extinct and still are in this area and so it was a really sad story but you know originally the people that live there they're they're from the soli tribe they have a woman chief and, you know, this woman chief, you know, t- it recounted to me the fact that, you know, back in the day, they, they would hunt an animal here or there and they would share it with everybody in their community. And, you know, it wasn't killed for, you know, for market reasons, you know, like what we did here in the 7, 16, 17, 1800s, they, you know, it was killed just to feed a handful of people. And so when the Nortons showed up, they said, hey, guys, we got to figure something out. And the long and the short of it is, is they came up with a multifaceted faceted economic program, which included, they invested their own money in building an above, you know, they built a fish farm. So what they wanted to do is, is they built five 30,000 gallon above ground tanks and where they control every aspect of the fish's life. And they're growing tilapia, which is the local fish that comes out of local waters there. Uh, it's a native fish. And what they can do is, is uh, basically create a protein source so that the local people don't feel like they need to kill the game animals. And of course, with the fish farm created jobs, but some really unique and interesting things happen here, which you normally don't see in Africa. Uh, Zambia only does seven to 10 year lease agreements on these concession areas. So as an operator, they'll bid, all these operators will bid on different areas and they'll bid certain, you know, a certain amount of money that they will guarantee they'll give the government, which is National Wildlife and Parks, and the local community. And so, you know, if there's lots of wildlife and the, and the operator can have lots of clients come and go on hunts, then they'll obviously pay more money. Well, there's no hunting quota here. Nobody wanted to be in this place. And this family's forking out hundreds of thousands of dollars of their own money to build this infrastructure. And the community was so happy with that. And, and that not to mention the first day they showed up, kids were literally starving to death in their huts because of uh, the food, the uh, lack of food there. They're subsistence farmers. They're trying to scratch out a living in areas that have subs, uh, you know, just substandard soils. They're trying to grow corn, which is you know, obviously native to North America. It needs a lot of water, it needs a lot of nutrients. You know, think about Iowa. And they don't have that there, but, they, but Africans love corn. And so when their crops get, uh, you know, either shrivel up because of lack of rainfall or they don't have good enough nutrients in the soil or, you know, some animals, you know, baboons love corn. And guess what? Baboons are all over the place in, in many parts of Africa. You know, hippos come out of the water and, and like to eat corn too. So it's, it's a real difficult situation for these people. So literally kids were starving to death, but they came up with this plan. They needed to stop the poaching. So they were able to institute the start of an anti-poaching team. So I think there were six, six gentlemen that were patrolling about 1.3 million acres, which is about a little over half of the area, which is what they ended up picking up. You know, there's two different areas. And so they've got this big area. They weren't really doing any anti-poaching work. And, the, you know, the animals were just being decimated. And they used, they kill the animals through wire snares, which are indiscriminate killers. I mean, they would lose entire generations of, of animals, different species of animals, because, you know, the females and the young are the ones that are more apt to be caught in a snare, because when that wire snare goes over the neck of, uh, or over the head of, say, a, 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 a buck or a male ant, uh, antelope, almost always, you know, they, they always have, they have horns, but those horns will hit that wire and you'll hear this kind of unnatural sound to them. And they'll back out of it, the males will, whereas the females will feel that pressure around their neck when that snare gets on there. And they almost always, it's that, that instinct for flight and it just kills them right there. And so one poacher can put out a hundred snares in a week. 
and he may come back and, and check two or three. He might check and get two or three animals, but he may leave the rest of them out there. Never, never check on them again. So they continue killing and killing or maiming, you know, your predators, your lions, your leopards. I've seen them with missing legs, you know, missing paws. I've seen warthog missing hooves. I've seen different antelope missing, missing hooves, things like that. And that's all from that. But the other way they do it is they'll, they'll take, they make their own firearms, muzzle loaders and shotguns, and they'll sit around the water. Because, you know, everything in Africa has got to come to drink. So that's the key thing when you're out there. And these poachers will sit around the water holes and they'll literally shoot everything they can, dry the meat, and then they'll pack it out as quick as they can. The other thing they'll do is they'll use dogs and they'll run dogs. Now, this is an area where it's hard for people to survive in. So if they've got a pack of dogs in their village, then you know they're feeding the dogs for a purpose. And that purpose is poaching. And they'll lo- those dogs will run an antelope to the point where it gets so tired they can go in and they'll take rebar and they'll sharpen the end of rebar, attach it to a stout pole, and, the- and they'll use it like a, a little stab these animals and kill them where the animal finally gets too tired to run. So that's what they came across was this huge problem. You know, of course, there's all kinds of other issues from uh, malaria is a real problem there. AIDS is to some extent, it's not as great as, as many other areas of Africa, but uh, sleeping sickness, this is an area that has the tsetse fly. And so it carries the same parasite that gives sleeping sickness to humans and, and also causes domestic animals not to survive. So there's no domestic animals there. You know, there's people dying of sleeping sickness. And, and because it gets so difficult to survive and they have large families because kids don't always make it. So they'll have five, six, seven, eight, nine kids, 10 kids in a family. You get a daughter who reaches puberty, 12, 13 years of age, 14 years of age. Guess what? I can get 30 bags of corn for Well, 30 bags of corn will feed my family for a year. So the incident of child brides is really high in this area, which is a really sad thing. So what the Nortons came across was the, just a real shit show. And they came in and they came up with a plan and, and, and none of it was handouts. None of this is the UN, you know, going, here you go, here's some food or whatever. Yeah, they helped feed some kids to keep them from starving the first year they were there. But they made these commitments. They built this fish farm. They literally helped the community as partners in everything they did get up the first couple rungs of the ladder of prosperity. And it's just been remarkable. I got there in 2017. Like I said, I met Roland in 2016. I came out in in May of 2017. I took photographer Tony Bynum with me, a good friend of mine. And we just tried to see if there was really a story here. And we spent a couple of weeks photographing and filming and talking to people. And I was like, yeah, you know, this is, this is pretty interesting. Over the next three and a half years, I spent about 100, 120 days in country, literally documenting everything that was happening as we could while we were there. So, you know, the chief and the different headsmen and the different families from farmers to up in the highlands, which, is, which gets more rain and they can grow corn to the lowland farmers. I mean, just these incredible stories about things that were working, some things that weren't working. Of course, the first time we were there, I think Tony and I saw maybe a dozen wildlife. I mean, it certainly wasn't the Serengeti, you know, and this is a pretty, this is, this area is not a big open plain. I mean, like you said earlier, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a valley. It's a large valley that's rimmed on the north end with, it actually has a cliff face on there. That's the same kind of cliff face that goes all the way up through to Tanzania and Kenya. And then it's got mountain, you know, I'll say big mountains, but pretty rugged hills, pretty brutal to walk around in. And it's filled with brush and Mopani, you know, different stages of Mopani forest. So everything from uh, brush to, uh, to cathedral forest, beautiful, beautiful place. I mean, it's, you know, it's kind of like this ultimate wildlife habitat, but it didn't have any, hardly any wildlife in it, except for some little pockets here and there. So over the course of the years, as I kept going back and going back, it seemed like every year, I mean, seeing more and more and more wildlife. And if you talk to any scientist, they'll tell you that, that knows anything about wildlife conservation. Everything in the wild, everything on the planet, Mother Nature, is got programmed to overpopulate the carrying capacity of the land. So if you take care of it, it's amazing what Mother Nature will do if you don't mess it up. And so over the course of that time, we were able to, to see wildlife to the point where you know, the last trip that I did there to finish the film was in September of, of 2020. You know, coming out of the, out of the height of the, of the COVID closures and everything, and uh, which was an experience by itself, traveling around the world with all that going on. But once <laughs> I finally got there and started, I mean, I literally was seeing hundreds, if not a thousand animals in a day. 
uh, it was just incredible what had happened and, and watching kids that, uh, you know, they were going to school on day one in open, open air thatched roof structures and no walls, just posts with a roof on it made out of thatch, no schoolroom, no supplies, no desks, no uniforms. The teachers weren't even getting paid. And one of the coolest things about this project was that the first trip I came home and my father-in-law, Dr. Dalos, was at our house here visiting the grandkids. And I, and I didn't really understand what he had going on, but, you know, he had started, uh, he'd done some hunting in Africa and then had kind of an epiphany. And he, he started this thing called African Children's Schools and, and mostly in Ethiopia. And, and he started building schools in the bush. You know, here's a hunter who saw a need and he gave up hunting and put all of his extra money that he makes as a doctor and uses that to build schools in the bush to help these people out. And I was like, wow, that's really cool. But, you know, I never really paid much attention. So he's like, hey, what were you doing? And I started showing him some pictures and showed him some video. And, you know, one of the videos we showed him was of a concrete slab with a bunch of blocks laying around it. The community was supposed to build a school, but they ran out of money. Well, the next day we're on the phone with the Nortons on a WhatsApp call. And, and, I, and he's like, so what do you guys need to build the school? And I said, well, we need to build a school and we need this. We need to build another school. Within a week, African children's schools had wired them 50% of the cost to build that first school. And within, by the time it was all done, they had paid for everything, they paid for the a concrete block structure with metal roof, with windows and doors, uh, concrete floors, you know, bathrooms, a teacher's uh, office, school supplies, uniforms for all the kids and salaries for the teachers. The teachers are gonna get paid. And so I did a deal with Roland. I said, hey, Roland, I'll help you raise money for these types of things. Now, these are things that the Nortons had committed to doing and had budgeted for with the community as part of their business plan. I said, so this means I've just freed up whatever, $20,000, $50,000, whatever in your budget. You have to guarantee me that if with every dollar that I bring to you like this for these types of projects, you're going to turn around and add that into your anti-poaching efforts. And so it just, it, it basically put their anti-poaching efforts on, on steroids. And so it, it just was really incredible. But the, one of the coolest things about that, the first year that we did this, we needed to order, I think it was 120 uniforms for the kids. And they just, each kid gets a uniform. And this would be the equivalent of like elementary school up through junior high. Secondary schools go through a government school where the kids have to travel. Right. But, and before this program, those children in that community didn't have any school. Wait, they just had, they had a thatched roof open air school with one of the elders or one of the yeah. adults that had a little bit of an education trying to teach them basic arithmetic and whatever, all in solely. But now with the schools that have been built, and this has blossomed into just way more, you know, we're, I think we're into six classroom blocks now in three different schools, teachers' residences and all that stuff. But now the last fall, the grant request for uniforms was 600. Wow. And these kids are learning English. And that is the language of the world's economics. These are kids are going to be the leaders of Zambia tomorrow. And they understand that the whole reason why this exists is because of hunting and the value that hunting brings to their community when it comes to the conservation of their wildlife and habitat. And so it, it's it, just it's, that's so incredible. And in the film, you even talk about other aspects of women empowerment that the program has brought to to make a, a thriving community. And I think all of it is going to be super great for somebody that would like to watch it. You said the name of the program that your father-in-law had for the schools. What's the name of that? It's African Children's Schools. So if you go to okay. africanchildrenschools.org, you can, you can find them. And of course, if you want to find what we've got going on, go to shepherdsofwildlife.org. You can locate our film, Killing the Shepherd, there. It's also now available on Tubi, which is an ad-based free deal, if you don't mind watching some ads. Uh, Zumo, let's see what else. It's on Apple TV. It's on Amazon Prime. It's on, I don't know, eight or nine different platforms online, but you can also watch it through our website at uh, killingtheshepherd.com and you can get there and watch the film. So it's been really just an incredible ride. And then, you know, of course, what came out of this, I mean, we're doing this because we want to educate people and it's tough to get people to sit down and watch a 73 minute film if they don't have time. So, you know, our decision makers, our politicians, uh, you know, our media folks, uh, even kids in school, you know, they just don't have that amount of time. So we created a sub 30 minute version, educational version of Killing the Shepherd. And that's what I've been able to take to various, uh, you know, we screened it in Congress with members of Congress uh, in the Capitol last spring, just got 
an invite to screen it at the UK House of Commons in February, taken it to various state legislatures and been able to screen it with, you know, large numbers of their state legislators so they can understand what the ramifications are if they were to enact trophy import bans, which is being really pushed by the, you know, the, the, uh, the anti-hunting groups, anti, you know, animal, you right. know, animal and they use that groups, word so. trophy. I mean, you just yeah. said the, that word, I mean, because yeah. that's what the, the bands are titled, but you and I both know it's not a trophy. Yeah, and- I know. And that's, and that stems, it comes from the Boone and Crockett trophy book. And mm-hmm. that is what the antis have been able to kind of glom onto. I mean, we all know trophies in the eye of the beholder. I mean, it's a memory. I mean, I'm sitting mm-hmm. in a house right now that my wife has hunted more animals than I have, but you know, between the two of us, our house is like, well, she's also a museum curator for natural, uh, natural history museums. So uh, we have lots of full mounted animals in our home. And every one of these is a memory of an experience in the field where all of us, every hunter can tell you where they were, what they were doing, who they were with, what the weather was like, you know, all yeah. the things, things we ate, the things we did, the things we talked about. And, and it's really, it's what, it's part of what makes us humans. You know, you go back in history and we do this in Killing the Shepherd. You'll, there's a section in there that we talk about, you know, where it's just this incredible animation where this cave wall comes alive with these pictographs telling the story of humanity's relationship with wildlife over the last 10,000 years. Yeah. And, you know, there's a reason why we hang those antlers up or those skulls up even in this modern age. And it's, you know, back in the day, that was just a way of telling folks in the community that we were resourceful. You know, we were good hunters. We could provide for people in our communities. And now even in this day and age, you know, it's, you know, we have to be careful because I've watched it go from a, what I would call more of a biocentric approach to hunting to what I term an egocentric approach, right. um, you know, where people are kind of portraying, hey, I'm doing this because I'm this great hunter and look at me i've got so many booners and or this is a 170 class this or 200 inch this or whatever it is and unfortunately when we talk to the non-hunting public and post that stuff online they don't understand you know the money you spent the time the, right. the blood and sweat, they also fear, don't understand you know? maybe the habitat that was there that caused that animal to become so large or you know the whole demographic of how that animal became that animal. That's something that I think even some hunters don't pay attention to, you know, but there are some who do. And again, it's telling that story of how that, how it came about. I do have another question for you in making this film, you were talking about how many times you've been back and forth. Are you paying for this out of your own pocket or how do you have an organization? Do you get, you know, who's funding this? Yeah. So trying to kick this off, I, I, I pitched it around to a lot of high net worth individuals and they all looked at me and went, what, what do you want money for? And I was like, well, you need to support me. We need to tell the story. And you need to go on like, vacation I, and I want to pay yeah, for it. <laughs> yeah. Well, unfortunately, uh, Tom here underwrote the vast majority of the costs, you know, towards the end when people started to see what we we're doing, we we're able to get, let's see who helps us. We had a couple of folks here in Montana step up with some checks and the Potterfields from Midway USA, you know, Brenda Potterfield's been a great supporter of ours and she stepped up and helped us. And so it helped us finish up the film. But to answer your question, uh, back to kind of why, how I got back here, the very first question was, uh, you know, literally, and and I I was talking to a a neighbor of mine here, who's one of the top real estate attorneys in Southern California, and he's got a house down the road from me for, you know, his his second home. And uh, he was like, you know, what are you trying to do? Why are you trying to do it? And I said, you know, I, I we've tried to figure out how we could get people in the hunting industry to work together and it doesn't seem to work. And you know, matter of fact, it doesn't work at all. Everybody's worried that you're going to somehow take something away from them. So I said, I've got this idea for this, this nonprofit that, you know, we really could be a catalyst for change, but you can't be a, a safari club or an NRA or even one of our wildlife centric organizations because the antis of, you know, are very well organized. They have based on their 990 tax returns, have about a billion dollars every year annually, you know, that they can use against or to further their progress and their causes. And so they're well organized, they're well funded, and the hunting community's not well organized, probably not organized at all, and, and is very, very badly funded. 
So I said, you know, I just want to get it beyond all that. Let's just create something. And, and, and I've got all these wildlife photographers I work with, all these other outdoor filmmakers. And they're like, you know, guys, we got to do something. We're out in nature. We're filming. We're capturing things. We're seeing what's going on. We're also seeing man's impact on the world's wildlife populations. And it's not pretty. It is not good what's happening. And so how about we take our skill sets, our content, and that start educating? Because online, what do people watch? They watch videos. They're looking at pictures. They're looking at visual media that's what really resonates uh, it, no matter what the generation is old the young and invite and, and everything in between and so what we did is we created a 501c3 called the shepherds of wildlife society and our whole mission in a nutshell is to reconnect modern society with nature and we are you know we really believe in our modern conservation ethos and the fact that we've been able to showcase you know the greatest conservation model in the world here in north america you know wildlife has a value to rural communities communities, rural communities take care of it. And it doesn't matter if these communities are in Montana or northern Michigan or Colorado or in Zambia. You know, I mean, wildlife lives with people and the people they live with don't live in, you know, Madison Avenue or L.A. or, or Denver. They live out in the rural landscapes and these ecosystems. And so if these people see a value to having wildlife in their world, then they'll take care of it because they see that value. And there's just all kinds of incredible stories along that lines. So that's really what Killing the Shepherd's been able to do. I mean, why is it called Killing the Shepherd? Well, we're in a situation now where these rural communities, in this case, it's uh, the folks in the remote part of Zambia, they are the shepherds of their lands. You know, we know what shepherds are. They are the caretakers of these animals. And if they don't see a value, whether it be the shepherd taking care of his flock of sheep, if, if there's no value, he's not going to have any sheep. He's going to become something else. He's going to become a welder or he's going to become a farmer or he's going to be a fisherman if there's any fish. So what we see is that these people are being, you know, their way of life and their ability to take care of, of wildlife is being attacked by these anti-hunting groups, the antichrist of conservation, these preservationist groups. So the Humane Society of the United States, Humane Society International, Center for Biological Diversity, Defenders of Wildlife. I mean, you just, there's a long litany of these folks that, that are doing this stuff. And they only have one common thing that they want to achieve. They want to stop humans from utilizing wildlife, you know, the PETAs of the world. But that doesn't work because wildlife is always renewing itself. And as good stewards of the land, we have to make sure that we don't have excessive populations of animals. And we also want to provide for our own people. You know, we want to be able to utilize this incredible free range, the ultimate organic meat. So that's really what we're trying to tell here is the story of these communities. They are the shepherds who want to take care of their wildlife resources. And as long as they see a value, they will continue to take care of them. There's a long history in humanity of that happening. And of course, there's an equally a long history of it, of the opposite happening. So that's really what it is. And from this film, like I said, it's it had great success. You can watch it online. But then I've been asked to produce more films. So now we're at a point now where literally yesterday, I just did a deal with a, one of the major PBS stations here in the United States that we're going to broadcast every one of my films going forward with this PBS station and get it through into the, the whole syndication throughout the United States with all the PBS stations and literally telling the stories of different rural communities and their relationship with the land and the wildlife. We're, we've started production on a film here in Montana called The Real Yellowstone. So a little bit, you know, it's not so anything cool. to do Kevin Costner, but, you know, <laughs> Killing the Shepherd, The Real Yellowstone. And it's the story of fourth, fifth, sixth generation Montana rancher families and their relationship with wildlife and the land. And all these forces that seem to raid against them to remove them from the land. And I'm sure, Mia, you know what I'm talking about because you're mm -hmm. down there in Colorado. You know, we, I'm just wrapping up. I'll have done probably the, this summer a film called The Last Keeper. And it, I've spent 70 days this year already in Scotland, in the Highlands, telling the story of these rural communities and their relationship with the land and the wildlife. And there, there's no conservation going on except for the hunters, as far as land conservation goes and wildlife conservation. But it's this class warfare. I mean, literally, there's, it goes back to the battle of Mudden in 1746 and the Highland clearances, which was clan on clan genocide, you know, literally burning families yeah. and homes. So there's no one hand, hand grenades to each other. But it's cool because I'm able to talk to not only the sporting interests, the hunting people, the fishing people. I'm, I'm working with King Charles's retired gamekeeper, Peter Frazier, and a whole bunch of great people. But also I'm working with the, the, there's this whole movement of rewilding. 
where they there's a group of people that that have this thought process that they need to have scotland which mind you guys it's only the size of new jersey when it comes to land man you know it's got a big word big name they got some big britches but they're only the size of new jersey but they want to you know have trees and areas forested that haven't been forested in a thousand years or more some people would like to see bears you know, european brown bears and wolves back there now you're talking about scotland has four million people and they have seven million sheep you all know what's going to happen when you right. let go wolves in that area you know they've got about well, and 400, you say you all but i don't think everybody understands what happens <laughs> yeah yeah it's, uh, it's not, <laughs> they it's need not to really combat. see it's what not, happens it's, which is why i want people to go and sign up and for your releases of your new shows and watch the yeah, watch yeah, these you, you, you because you learn so much uh go to uh the shepherds of wildlife.org and and we've got our online sign up and you can get our news so we have a bi-weekly newsletter that comes out it's got lots of great information in it and they also you know you've got all this great work that's coming up and you did say like initially you were funding this yourself you've got some supporters over the years and I know that you do have a way to support Shepherds of Wildlife. Can they do that on that website? Yeah. So our website, people can make contributions. We love it if you want to do a monthly contribution. You know, Humane Society in the United States, they ask people for $19.99 a month. If you feel like doing that, we'd love to have that kind of support because it's all going towards the mission. None of our money pays for salaries, doesn't pay for overhead or like stuff. You know, we, we actually monetize products and the films and stuff like that and that page well, and that's what, something else that i wanted you to talk about was you talked about the snares and all these snares that you're that they are getting from the poachers if, if they can catch them if they find them and through the film and i mean i've seen them but you have snare bracelets now are those a way of raising money a mechanism for shepherds of wildlife also yeah, so back in 2019 when i was back in in zambia there was i was in camp in the fish farm there and there was this pile of snares i mean i think i don't know what the actual number is to date but through 2020 or 2021 from late 2015 over about a five little over five year period the nortons and their teams of of game scouts had removed from the bush over 20,000 wire snares and you know, every one of those snares is, can kill an animal. I mean, they, they don't put these things out for good looks. I mean, they're there to be effective killers. I saw this pile of stuff and I said, well, what do you guys do with these things? And they're like, well, you know, if we're pouring a concrete foundation or building a dam with concrete, we'll just throw them in there. You know, that way nobody can ever use them again. And this wire comes from, I mean, I mean, some of these poachers, they'll rip down power lines, you know, in order to, you know, to use, to find the, the copper wire or whatever they can make these things. And snares can be everything from guinea fowl stuff, you know, little small, little itty bitty things to cables that they use for hippos. I mean, it's, it's just crazy what they have there. And so I said, well, I, hey, wait a minute, I got an idea. Yeah, you know, just, you know, it's not that it's uh, some, you know, it's not that anybody hasn't done similar things to this, but I said, why don't we, uh, let's keep the better snares off the side. And I've got an idea. So I went back home and got with my daughter, who's kind of a, an artist. And, and I said, here's my idea. I've got some snares here. F figure out some way you could make a, a cool looking bracelet out of this that still looks like a snare. And so she worked on it. We came up with a couple of mock-ups. And then I sent them over to Africa, to Zambia. And the Nortons got uh, some gals to start working on that. And so what that, you know, this film, Killing the Shepherd, generated, uh, you know, organically created some incredible initiatives for us, you know, for our nonprofit. We now have a uh, rural women's empowerment initiative. So that's where this bracelet program falls under. So we have eight women in the community working full time. We pay their wages. That helps them take care of their families, you know, the kids and everything like that, put food on the table. And they are repurposing these wire snares into these bracelets. And so then we market those here in the United States. Our goal with the wire snare bracelets is to sell enough of them to be able to the point to not only pay for the wages and pay for the marketing costs and putting them out there and all the things that go with, with running that part of the business, but also be able to have enough money to put aside into an educational scholarship fund so that some of these gals that want to go 
on the secondary school because they have to pay for secondary school. It's not free like, you know, we hear in the United States, you know, obviously we pay property taxes, but it's not the same over there. But even having an opportunity for uh, you know, some of these gals if they want to go to university, it's a whole lot cheaper to go to university in Zambia than it is in, here in the United States. And so our goal is to be able to sell those. So if people are interested in supporting that effort, just say go to shepherdsofwildlife.org, uh, go to our store, you'll see there's a whole multitude of different bracelets. There are unisex, whatever design you like, we can f- have a size that fits you. There's a measurement form in there, it tells you how to measure your, uh, your wrist, to make sure you get the right size bracelet. It, it, just remember, every one of those bracelets is not only helping empower these women in Africa, but it's also, that's one less animal that could potentially kill them in the wild. So you literally are saving wildlife and empowering people that, that need all the help they can get. Absolutely. I'm so glad that you, you're sharing this story and not, not just the story about you and about creating these films, but that the films are going to be educating other people. And I can't wait for the next one to come out. And it's kind of funny. I, there's a couple authors that I have also that I'm like, have you written your next book? Have you written your next book? But that's kind of how I felt when I first saw Killing the Shepherd. I was like, oh my gosh, there's there's so much more because there's so many stories that can be told. And a couple of your projects that you mentioned today, I didn't even realize that you had coming up. So it's super exciting. And I hope that our listeners today appreciate you being on the show and that they'll go over and sign up for the newsletter so that they can see what you have coming up. And also please go and support Shepherds of Wildlife and this project. It really is not just helping hunting, it's helping communities and just the general human population. So thank you so much, Tom, for being on our show today. Yeah, thanks, Mia. But don't forget about the book. <laughs> oh, yes, you have a book. <laughs> Yeah, Tell me so about the killing, book. Killing the Shepherd Beyond the Film. It's going to soft launch here in December of 2022. Uh, it'll be out in 20, early 23, in January, early February. There will be a uh, hardcover, soft cover. There will also be an EPUB and an audiobook. And basically what the book does is it tells the story of everything that is in the film. But when you make a film, you know, you're, you're limited in what you can really tell. There's only so much time and so and also when you're editing a film a lot of incredible things can often end up on the cutting room floor uh, which means it doesn't get used in the film and so what the book does is it tells not only the story of the film but all of the things that fell through the cutting room floor and really delves a lot deeper into a lot of these subjects and in the end you know what we really do is we lay out a blueprint how africa could move forward all these different countries with their, with their communities and the safari operators, because I truly believe if we're going to have a wild Africa, if we're going to save these wild lions and this wild antelope and elephants and rhinos and all that stuff, then the people have to see a value. And with this economic blueprint that's come together out of what I witnessed in Zambia with the Nortons and the people of Shikabeta, the Soli tribe, I think that you could take that model to any part of Southern Africa or even Northern Africa, if they have the wildlife there and create a system that will ensure that, you know, we're not talking about hunting here. We're talking about biodiversity protection. This is about making sure our planet is healthy and will stay that way for forever in perpetuity. And I think, you know, we can, we have willing participants and we just need to motivate them and give them a reason to do it. And our governments have to also get on board with this and not have trophy import bans where, you know, oh, you can't bring your animals back from Africa because we don't think that's right. Um, right. And no in, in that sense, that. one country is hurting another. In, in this uh, community it, is hurting that community. It's nothing short of neocolonialism. And there's mm-hmm. a long history of colonialism that has really messed up Africa and other parts of the world because of that history. You know, it's, it's made arbitrary boundaries where you had, you know, just where they shouldn't be between different groups of people, wildlife and other situations like that. So, you know, what we need to be doing is, is creating programs where people can benefit for taking care of wildlife, wild places. And if they benefit, they'll take care of it. And your kids, my kids, our grandkids, our great grandkids will be able to go over to Africa and be able to see real lions, wild lions, not lions that are habituated in Kruger National Park to human beings. So they walk around, you know, in traffic jams and actually use safari vehicles to pen in wild game animals, hunt them. But, you know, they can really see what 
real Africa is meant to be. And the only way it's going to be that way is if people see some sort of value and they take care of it. And so really what the book does is it lays out that blueprint. You know, I, I hope that we get some traction, but it'll be available to folks that can, they'll be able to, to pick it up on our website, uh, shepherdsandwildlife.org. And uh, we're also on Facebook, we're on Instagram, we're on Twitter. Follow us on all those on all those platforms. You know, it's been great to be here talking to you and your audience, you know, because we've got to spread the word. And if we don't do it, we're going to lose everything that we hold dear to ourselves. Absolutely. Thank you so much. I, like I said, I really appreciate you coming on and sharing the information with my listeners. Hey, this is Lloyd Bailey, the Armed Lutheran, host of the Armed Lutheran radio podcast, reminding you that the podcast you're listening to is a proud member of the Self-Defense Radio Network. Check out all the great content at selfdefenseradio.net.